We'll be, uh, Brother Billy be leading us in 742, number 742. When upon life billows you are tempest all when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessing name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessing name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. being here and being part of our, our Sunday morning Bible class. We're glad that you're here. We have a whole list of announcements this morning, so just bear with me for just a few minutes uh, to get through these. Those that we know of that are sick, they're listed in the bulletin that we need to remember. Uh, Carrie Mooney, uh, Jerry Hester, Bernice Bowles, Brenda Taylor, Harold Horn, uh, Johnny and Ann Davis, uh, we got word this morning that Ann Davis had passed away, so we need to re remember her uh, and her family. Michelle Holcomb's surgery will be Thursday of this week in Jackson. Uh, Roger and Connie Mooney, Connie's scheduled for rehab in, uh, it says, Miami, Florida in April. Uh, Roosevelt Combs, uh, Sonia McDonald. Herlene McAnally, this is Bo's grandmother, uh, had a, uh, a broken hip, and she's in the, the Magnolia Hospital. Uh, Nana Barson, J.W. Phillips, and also Elsie Thompson's in the Tupelo Hospital, and Floyd McCrary. We need to remember all of these folks in our in our prayers this week. A uh, couple other announcements: visitation luncheon is today. Uh, if you're going on the Ark Encounter trip, there will be a meeting uh, immediately following services this morning. As so Jim says, it's a short meeting. Uh, Lads, the leaders, Bible Bowl participants are asked to meet tonight here in the auditorium with a parent. Uh, so if you, have your, if you are a parent or a grandparent that's watching out after a child that's in Bible Bowl, uh, be, be here in the auditorium tonight. Uh, and next Sunday is the Easter egg hunt uh, following the morning worship service. So uh, we have a lot of things. I saw on the uh, calendar out there that April is full. Uh, there's something going on every week and almost every day in the month of April. Today we'll be looking at the, at the book of Zechariah. Uh, we're getting close to the end of the the minor prophets, and I know you're ready to, to be done with them. Uh, next Sunday will be Malachi, and that's the last of the uh, minor prophets. We'll have a Sunday off because uh, uh, of Easter Sunday. 
he's come. Brian Galloway will be here to take care of the class next, uh, the, the Easter Sunday. And then Brother Jim is going to start another series uh, after that. So uh, I've got today and one more one more Sunday. Uh, and then we'll be through with Minor Prophets. Uh, today we want to talk about Zechariah. Uh, and Zechariah, the, the book of Zechariah, is one of the longest of the Minor Prophets. Uh, and, and, uh, and it seems like it's actually two books in one. The first eight chapters uh, are concerned with rebuilding the temple. And after that, it's uh, chapters 9 through 14 are uh, some prophecies concerning the coming Messiah. So uh, Zechariah is a little different from the other one. Uh, as you look at the very first verse of the book of uh, Zechariah, it says, In the eighth month of the second year of Darius. If you'll remember the book of Haggai last week, he started out in the first day of the sixth month. So this Zechariah is starting to write two months after uh, Haggai had written. And uh, as, as he dates himself in the first eight chapters, uh, you'll see that, he, that, that his messages go for about two years. Uh, and that uh, after that time, uh, the uh, the rest of the book is written at some later date. Uh, so it's uh, it's a little different from from the others. Uh, and it says that uh, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, uh, and 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 he talks about his father and his grandfather uh, both being being prophets. It's it's. We get the impression that Zechariah is a is a priest. Uh, that he's one of the priests that's, that that has been brought back uh, to to reinstitute the worship uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, he's like Zach, uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Uh, he's he's from a priestly descent, uh, and he re had returned under the leadership of Zerubbabel. So he's one of those that had been returned from from Babylon uh, to uh, Jerusalem, uh, and he is there to to help fill the uh, the void there in the priesthood, uh, and he's also come to help uh, Haggai. Some would look at the book of Zechariah and think that it's a sequel to the uh, to the book of Haggai. Uh, the the date. As we see here in the very first verse, it's in the uh, eighth month of the second year, which is two months after uh, Haggai had started his prophecy. Uh, and the first eight chapters end in about 518 uh, B.C., uh, starting 520 in 518 B.C. And then the, the rest of the book is written at some later date. We're not real sure about that. A little background. Uh, basically, the same things that were going on when Haggai wrote his book were going on when Zechariah was writing his, and they were working together. Uh, if you'll remember last week, we looked at a couple passages from the book of uh, uh, Ezra, uh, where, where he was talking about that, that he was returning with these two prophets, uh, and, and the same things were going on. And if you remember from last week, uh, they had they had come to Jerusalem in about 536 B.C. They they laid the foundation of the temple, they built the altar, so that sacrifices could be offered, and then it it uh, lay idle for about 16 years. No one did any work on the temple uh, for about 16 years. And uh, there were a lot of reasons for that. There was a lot of opposition from the people around them. There was a, a, not a lot of resources that they could work with. And so the people became comfortable without the temple being rebuilt. Uh, they, had, they had ceased work by the time of the second year of Darius. And the Lord sent two, two prophets. He sent uh, Haggai and Zechariah. Uh, they were called to, to the work of, of getting the Jews to get back to working on the temple. 
That was their major focus, to get back on the, on the, on the work. The, the walls of the city of Jerusalem and the, the, the town itself was in disrepair, and it had been that way for 50 years for at least 50 years. And uh, food was scarce, resources were scarce, uh, the neighboring uh, people around them were not friendly, and they were, they were comfortable with not doing anything on the temple because it, uh, the least you do, the least problems you'll have. And they had become comfortable doing that. And then comes Haggai and Zechariah. And they start to, uh, to tell the people that they need to get up and do something. Don't just sit there. Get up and do something. Because God was expecting you to do it. Uh, a quick outline uh, in the first chapter, the first six verses, is a call to repentance. Uh, and then there are eight visions uh, found from uh, chapter 1 through chapter uh, 6. Uh, and in chapter 7 and 8, uh, 7, there's a question of fasting that we'll look at in 7 and 8. And then the last section of the book is uh, chapters 9 through 14, uh, where some prophecies that, uh, that we'll look at very briefly at the end of the lesson today. So let's look at what Zechariah had to say. The very first thing uh, that, that we notice about the book, it's the longest of the minor prophets and also kind of obscure. We don't hear much about Zechariah. One thing I noticed in the, in, in the studying for this is that there are at least 27 people named Zechariah in the Old Testament. So that's a, a very common name. But yet, uh, this prophet, he, he's known as a prophet, and he's also known as the son and grandson of a prophet. So uh, he, he has uh, uh, a little experience in this. Uh, let's look at this call for repentance. Chapter 1, verses 2 through 6. The Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore, says to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, saith the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets preached, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds, but they did not hear nor heed me, says the Lord. I know you've heard the, the expression that if, uh, that if you fail to learn from history, you're bound to repeat it. This is what the, the prophet was saying to the folks. Uh, he was reminding them uh, that they need to learn the lessons from history, that they need to look back at, what, at why God had become angry with them and why God didn't bless his people uh, in, in times before them. They needed to learn this lesson. Uh, and it's a lesson that we need to learn too. We need to look back through history and see how God dealt with folks. And they, here the prophet was saying, you look back and you see how God has dealt with your fathers. Uh, and, and here he says, now turn from your evil ways uh, and your evil deeds. He says they didn't heed their fathers didn't heed the, the, uh, the warnings uh, and that they, they need to listen to the warnings. Uh, the, the former prophets, the ones before these, had cried out, but it had been in vain. Uh, the, the children of Israel had not listened. Uh, the, the calamities of the exile had come about because they did not listen to what God had to say to them. They didn't heed what the prophets are saying. Uh, and it's a lesson for us today that we need to heed what the prophets were saying. And I suppose this is probably one of the greatest lessons that you'll learn out of the minor prophets is you need to listen to what God is saying to his people and you need to obey uh, his commands. After that, uh, in, in the, the book, it's a series of, of eight uh, 
visions or night visions that he calls them. Uh, let's look at the very first one. Uh, well, uh, read verse 7 for us, please. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shebat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berachah, the son of Edu, the prophet. I right. saw... That, 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 there for just a second. Notice that he's talking about the 24th day of the 11th month. When you go back to Haggai, he stopped prophesying in the ninth month, about the same time of the month. So this is a couple months after Haggai had completed his writings that uh, the Zechariah is starting to see these eight visions. All right, let's look at the very first vision of uh, Verses uh, 8 through 11. I saw by night, and behold, a man riding on, on a red horse, and it stood among the myrtle tree in the hollow, and behind him were horses red, tall, and white. Then I said, My Lord, what are these? So the angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. And the man who stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are the ones whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they answered the angel of the Lord who stood among the myrtle tree and said, We have walked to and fro throughout the earth, and behold, all the earth is resting quietly. All right, notice here that the very first vision is, is a, uh, a picture of four horses. Four horses that were walking to and fro uh, on the earth. Uh, and Zechariah didn't understand what it was talking about. But the good thing is that, that the angel gave him uh, a explanation of, of what was going on. Uh, and and he, here he's talking about that the, that the horses, uh, that he was assured that God had pity on his people uh, and that Jerusalem would be rebuilt. Uh, I'm sure they were they were wondering, uh, is Jerusalem ever going to be, be be rebuilt? Look at verses 16 through 17 for us, please. And uh, therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts, and a surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Again. Verse Again proclaim, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, My city shall again spread out throughout through prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. All right, here, here's a prophecy that, that's coming from this vision of the four horses. is that God is going to rebuild Jerusalem. If you can imagine, if you were a resident of Jerusalem, and you had seen that the city had set in ruins for 50 or 60 years, uh, the, the captivity lasted 70 years, and the city had set in ruins for all of this time, what would you think? Well, no one's ever going to rebuild the city. It's not going to come back. And yet here the prophet Zechariah is telling the folks that Jerusalem is coming back it's going to be rebuilt. Then the second vision, the four horns and the, uh, the four smiths, uh, verses 18 through uh, 21. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were four horns. And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these? So he answered me, These are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen, and I said, what are these coming to do? So he said, These are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could lift up his head. But the craftsmen are coming to terrify them, to cast them out, to cast out the horns of the nations that lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter it. All right, notice that the, the, the horns represent those that had scattered the, the people all over the country. That was the power. The horns represent power. And when we look in the book of Revelation, when he talks about horns, he talks about power. That, the, that a power greater than, than the, uh, the residents of Jerusalem had scattered them. 
But then he talks about the, the, the craftsmen that were coming back, the ones that were rebuilding the city. They were going to, to scatter those that had the power to, to scatter God's people. And the message is that the opposition to the rebuilding of Jerusalem was soon going to be taken away, that God was going to allow His people to rebuild the city. Right, the third vision, the man holding a, a measuring line, verses chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. So I said, What are you going? Where are you going? And he said to me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what it is its width and what is its length. And there was the angel who talked with me going out, and another angel was coming out to meet him. He said to him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. For I, saith the Lord, will be a wall of fire all around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. Were the walls of the city ever rebuilt? Yes, they were. Nehemiah came back and he rebuilt the walls. So God is talking about something other than the physical walls of the city of Jerusalem. He's talking about that He's going to make Jerusalem a great city again. That, 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 the, that the city will be rebuilt. But He's also passing on a message here that Jerusalem is going to be a city without walls where all kinds of nations will come together. Notice verse 10, Sing and rejoice, O daughters of Zion, for behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst, saith the Lord. God was, was bringing back His people, and that He was going to dwell in His midst. Another interesting thing in this chapter, if, you, if you're looking at your Bible, look at verse 13. It says, Be silent all flesh before the Lord. For he is aroused from his holy habitat, habitation. Doesn't that sound familiar from the book of Haggai, where Haggai says, The Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth keep silence before him. Haggai and, and Zechariah were trying to pass on the same message, that God is great, God is going to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, and that uh, all they have to do is sit and watch because amazing things are going to happen because of the power of God. All right, the the uh, fourth vision, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And, and I said, let them put a clean turban on his head, so that so they put a clean turban on his head, and they put the clothes on him, and the angel of the Lord stood by. Notice here, Joshua the priest, and, and he's standing there, and Satan is accusing him, just like he's in court, saying, "Look at this man standing here in filthy garments. How can he be sanctified? How can he be pure in the sight of God?" And then, he, then uh, Joshua is told that, that he's going to have clean garments and a new turban, that he's going to be made clean. If you remember back in the book of, of Haggai, it talks about that, that they were unclean, but that God was going to clean them. And the message of this, of this vision is that God was going to clean His people that they were going to be His people. They were going to offer sacrifices again in Jerusalem, sacrifices that would be acceptable to God. 
Notice verse 10 of, of chapter, I mean, uh, verse 9, uh, if you would, verse 9. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. Uh, verse 8. Uh, go back up one verse. I missed, gave you the wrong one. Here, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your com- companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign, for behold, I am bringing forth my servant the branch. In the book of Jeremiah, it talks about the branch of David when he's talking about the Messiah. When Zechariah is talking about the Messiah, he's talking about the branch. That the branch, the Messiah, is coming someday. Uh, here we have a, a prophecy of, of the coming Messiah. Uh, and that, that he's going to, to be coming to his people. It was going to be a, a, about 400 more years before the Messiah came. But here we're seeing prophecies of things that were going to happen over the next 400 years. The, uh, the, the next vision is the candlesticks, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Now the angel who talked, now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who is wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? So I said, I am looking, and there is a lampstand of soil gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at the left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know that what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Notice here you have a a vision of of a lampstand, and it has seven lights. And then you also have, have in the vision, you have the two olive trees. Commentators say that the two olive trees were the leaders of the civil and religious uh, leaders of their times, Zerubbabel and Joshua. They were standing on the side, and the, the lampstands would, would, would visualize the all-seeing power of God. That God was there in the midst of them, uh, and that God would make sure that the things that needed to be done would be taken care of. Over in verse uh, verse nine, we see we see a part of this. It says, "The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of the temple. His hand shall also finish it. Then you will know the Lord of hosts that has sent me to you." It took about four years to rebuild the temple. It had sat idle for 16 years, and and they rebuilt it in four years. God was with them. God blessed them when they started to rebuild the temple. And here we see that God is represented as seeing and knowing all things in in the lampstand and shining His light throughout that land. Uh, the, the sixth vision is the flying scroll, verses, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Then I turned and raised my eyes and saw there a flying scroll. And He said to me, What do you see? So I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits and its width 10 cubits. Then He said to me, This is a curse that goes out over the face of the whole earth. Every thief shall be expelled according to the side of side of the scroll. Every perjurer shall be ex- expelled according to that side of it. I will send out the curse, saith the Lord of hosts. It shall enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name. It shall remain in the midst of his house and consume it with its timber and stones. Notice here that. Uh, the question is answered, uh, how can 
crime be removed from Israel? How's God going to take away all of the evil and all of the bad things that were going on? And here, Zechariah has a vision. A vision of flying scroll. The scroll will fly over the houses of those, the houses and the lands, and it's going to curse those that, uh, that uh, destroy the, and destroy the houses of the thieves and the perjurers. That God would take care of those that were, uh, that were thieves, who would take care of the, those that were telling falsehood, that God had His own plan that God would take care of them because they were going to be His people and He was going to, uh, to, to curse those that were thieves in their, their community. Uh, the seventh vision, chapter 5, 5 through 11. Then the angel who talked with me came out and said to me, Lift your eyes now and see what this is that goes forth. So I asked, What is it? And he said, It is a basket that is going forth. He also said, this is their resemblance throughout the earth. Here is a lead disc lifted up. This is a woman sitting inside the basket. And he said, This is wickedness. And he thrust her down into the basket and threw the lead, lead cover over its mouth. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were two women coming with the wind in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. So I said to the angel who talked with me, where are they carrying the basket? And he said to me, To build a house for it in the land of Shinar. Then when it is ready, the basket will be set there on its base. In this vision, we have a woman that comes. She sits in a, a, a basket, a, about an ephah, about seven to eight gallon basket. And it identifies the woman as wickedness. How's God going to, to make the land pure again? He's going to remove the wickedness. And He's sending the woman that's called wickedness into the basket, and the basket is taken away from the midst of the children of Israel. God is going to cleanse the land again. And in this vision, we see that, that the Zechariah is saying that the land is going to be cleansed. Uh, all of the wickedness is going to be taken away, that they are going to be His people, and that He is going to take care of them. Then we have the last vision, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Then I turned and raised my eyes and looked, and behold, four chariots were coming forth between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. With the first chariot were red horses, and with the second chariot, black horses. With the third chariot, white horses, and with the fourth chariot, dappled horses, strong steeds. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said to me, These are four spirits of heaven that go out from their stations before the Lord of all the earth. The one with the black horse is going to the north country. The white are going after them, and the dappled are going toward the south country. Then the strong steeds went out, eager to go, that they might walk, that they might walk to and fro throughout the earth. And he said, Go walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they walked to and fro throughout the earth. And he called to me and spoke to me, saying, See, those who go toward the north country have given rest to my spirit in the north country. Notice here you have a, a the last vision is of, of four chariots coming out, and they're going in different directions. The message from the prophet here is that God will protect His people, that, that God, through His providence, will take care of those that follow Him. Uh, and when God is in, is in control the earth will be at peace. That they are going to have peace because God is protecting them. You know, we have a lesson here for us is that when we rely on God, God through His providence will protect His people. That He will keep us from harm. 
Uh, and that as long as we're following after God, God is going to take care of His people. Then we get to chapter 7, which is uh, uh, an interesting uh, few verses here about fasting. Uh, chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. Now in the fourth year of King Darius, it came to pass that the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, Chislev. When the people sent Chizara with Regum, Melech, and his men to the house of God to pray before the Lord, and to ask the priests who were in the house of the Lord of hosts and the prophets, saying, Should I weep in the fifth month and fast as I have done for so many years? Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Say to all the people of the land and to the priests, when you have fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months during these seventy years, did you really fast for me? For me, when you eat and when you drink, do you not eat and drink for yourselves? Should you not have obeyed the words which the Lord proclaimed through the former prophets when Jerusalem and the cities around it were inhabited and prosperous, and the south and the south and the lowlands were inhabited? I was here that I delegation of, of people from Bethel had come down to Jerusalem to talk to the priest, and they were asking questions about fasting. Should we, should we fast on these certain days? And they were reminded that there was only one day that had been set aside for fasting, and that was the Day of Atonement. And through their traditions, they had set up different days of fasting because of different calamities that come upon the people. And they were asking the question, should we fast at all of these days because that was the way that things had happened while they were in bondage, while they were, were uh, scattered abroad. They remembered the days by fasting. And they were asking the priest, should we continue to follow these fasting days? They were reminded that they were, there was only one day, the Day of Atonement, had been set aside for fasting. But Zechariah used the occasion to teach a lesson here. Let's look at verses uh, 8 through 10. I will bring them back, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong. You have been hearing in these days. These words by the mouth of the prophets who spoke in the days of the foundation was in the day the foundation was laid for the house of the Lord of hosts, that the temple might be built. For before these days there were no wages for man, nor any hire for beast. There was no peace from the enemy for whoever went out or came in. For I said, All men, every everyone against his neighbor. Now, but now I will not treat the remnants of this people as in the former days, says the Lord of hosts. Evidently, I gave you the wrong wrong scripture. We're, we're in chapter 7. Uh, let me just read it 8 through 10. Eight through ten. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the Lord, word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Execute true justice, show mercy and compassion, every one to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. Which is more important, fasting or doing what he says here, execute true justice, show mercy and compassion. Zechariah is reminding them that fasting may be important, but it is not as important as what he says to execute justice. The prophet Micah, when asked what does God expect of them, he said basically the same thing. Execute justice. Show mercy and compassion. 
these are more important than whether you're fasting or not, whether you uh, are, whatever you're doing, it's more important to show that you are a follower of God by the things that you do. Zechariah wanted to, to, to pass on the point that, that God expects something of His people. And you know today people, if you tell them that you are, you're a Christian, it doesn't mean a lot. But if you show them you're a Christian by what you do and how you act, you'll teach a far greater lesson because God expects us to do basically the same thing. And then we get to chapter 8. And chapter 8, we won't read through it. It is a, a series of ten short messages. And they are meant for uh, to give some encouragement to the people. To encourage them to stay faithful. Uh, we, need, we need to be uh, encouraged uh, and, and to stay faithful. And here the, the prophet is, is uh, trying to give them some encouragement. And then we skip to the second half of the book, this chapter 9 through 14. Uh, and, uh, and it's basically in, in three different sections, uh, Zechariah 9 and 10, uh, where he is uh, denouncing the neighbors around them that are living within the promised land uh, and reminding them uh, that... that Zion and her Messiah is coming to triumph. Uh, chapter 9, verse 9, please. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king has come to you. He is just having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a foal of a donkey. Art the Messiah is coming. And how does it say the Messiah is coming? It's going to be riding on the donkey. When Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem, how did He come in? Riding on a donkey. How did the prophet Zechariah know this 400 years before it happened? God told him. And this is one of the, one of the uh, prophecies of Zechariah that, that comes true in the New Testament. Uh, chapter 10 and verse 6. I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back, because I have mercy on them. They shall be as though I had not cast them aside, for I am the Lord their God, and I will hear them. I was here, Zechariah, saying that, that, that God is coming back, that Jerusalem is coming back, and that He is going to bless Jerusalem, and that He is going to bless His people. Because he still has a purpose for these people. And that purpose won't be fulfilled for another 400 years. But God has a purpose, and he's bringing his people back. Uh, the second section, Zechariah uh, chapter 11, uh, and it talks about foolish uh, shepherds. Uh, and we won't take the time to read all of it, uh, but we'll... But let's look at uh, chapter 11, verse 7. It says, So I will feed the flock for, for slaughter. I will partic uh, participate uh, in particular the poor of the flock. I took to myself two staff, one called beauty and the other one called bonds, and I will feed the flock. And if you read through it, you'll see that, that, uh, that God has, has two staffs but the shepherds are not doing the job that they're supposed to do. And then he says he's going to break the first of the, uh, of the staffs, uh, uh, which is called beauty, down in verse 10. And when he breaks it, it's symbolizing the breaking of the covenant between God and the children of Israel because they had disobeyed him. And then as you read through there, you'll see that he broke the second staff, which is breaking away... Uh, Judah from, from Israel, the breaking of God's people, that this happened, all of this happened because the, the people were not following after God. Uh, and 
it's important to remember that when we follow God, that uh, we don't have to worry about it. Uh, that that God will take care of us. Uh, then the third section is Zechariah verses twelve, uh, chapters twelve through fourteen, and in this last section, it's it's two uh, sections to it. Uh, let's read uh, chapter twelve, verses eight and nine. And that day, the Lord would. Have... Defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David, and like the house of David shall be like God, like the angels of the Lord before them. And it shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Through whose house did Jesus come? He came through the house of David. And here we have a, a prophecy of the, the coming Messiah, coming through the house of David. Chapter 14, the very first verse, uh, it talks about the day of the Lord. Uh, it says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. That the day of the Lord will come, that God is going to take care of His people, and He's going to bring them back because He has a purpose for them. They haven't fulfilled their purpose, but they are fixing to uh, and when we look at the book of Zechariah in the New Testament, oh, I'm out of time. Uh, let's let's just stop there, and uh, let's have a prayer as we uh, stop today. Father, thank you for all of the messages of the prophet Zechariah for the things that he's telling us about the coming Messiah. We pray that that you will use us like you use the people in His day. Forgive us when we do wrong. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here today.